we have here Dr. Eric McIntosh, um, who currently works at Sintas Learning down in Austin, Texas. Um, Eric and, um, and his team are here visiting to do some other um, Sintas type work. And while they were in town, I thought that Eric might share out some of the work that he's been doing. Um, he works with colleagues, uh, Lori Schreiner and others, down at Azusa Pacific University. And they developed a model of student thriving that they've been putting through the paces in statistical tests using some statistical analysis that, um, that weren't previously available. Structural equation modeling is a, a newer technique because computers finally can do things with numbers that they weren't able to do before, just in terms of computing power. So uh, what really impressed me about um, the model that they've thrown together is, is, is um, how much uh, rigor they've, they've put it through in terms of testing its validity. Um, you can read about their model um, in a lot of different uh, peer-reviewed publications. They have a lot of technical uh, publications. You can go ahead and actually see how um, they put this thing together. But um, there's a nice book, Thriving in Transition. Um, and this is uh, edited by Lori Schreiner and, uh, and her colleagues. Eric has a chapter in here. Um, for those of you who know, Jillian Kinsey writes the introduction. Um, and so that's, that's a book. The other thing that... Um, that you can look into is, is they've also started to, to focus on the sophomore year experience. And there's another book that you can get also that is going to be coming out that's specifically about the sophomore application of the student practice. Uh, Eric has a lot of experience in student affairs. He used to be the vice president of student affairs at Dean's University in uh, Western Canada. And we're really delighted to have him here. And so let's give him a warm welcome and thanks for being here. Awesome, thank you. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure of mine to be here. Uh, it's a lot of fun to come and talk about things that you love in your life. And I have a lot of different loves in my life. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an introduction, um, I'm a father of three kids. Um, my oldest is eight and a half, and my youngest is three and a half. And we live now in Austin, Texas. We moved down there two years ago or so from Edmonton, Alberta. So coming here is a lot of fun because it looks a lot like home. So I feel a, a lot at home amongst the mountains and the drive. Uh, over from the freeways, it's uh, just really for me uh, harkens back to uh, Alberta, uh, and so uh, I get to uh, love on my kids when I go home and, and have all these other fun things. And then my work takes me around the world. And what I love to do is really talk about my research. So that's my second love outside of my family is the research that I get to do. Uh, and for the last ten years or so, I've been working with a, a really wonderful group of colleagues out of Los Angeles, uh, based at Azusa Pacific University, where we've been talking about student driving. So it was a re really great opportunity to come uh, when Mitchell said, hey, would you, would you share with the group that we can pull together on campus, talk about your, your research and ways that potentially you could begin to apply this work with the students you serve here uh, at, uh, at your university? And uh, I said, that'd be, that'd be awesome. So I'm super excited to have a room full of people on spring break week. Like, that's incredible um, when you could be out skiing or doing other fun things or sitting on a beach somewhere, potentially. But you're here, and so it's going to be awesome. We've booked a lot of time this afternoon. We probably won't go right till the end uh, because it's a Thursday of spring break week. And so if we can give you back a little bit of time at the end, that's great. Um, but we'll take a little bit of a refreshment break. Uh, near at the end of my talk, I want you to spend some time uh, reflecting individually on the work that you do and potentially how the thriving model intersects with that. And then pair up with a colleague or two, potentially in your area, to get that sense of like, what could we, we do as a next step with this kind of uh, understanding of, of, of student success? If we think about student success in this way, what might we do next? And, and how might we take an action uh, based on what you've learned today. So uh, that's just, a, like I say, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm trying to think, I've got two colleagues from Civitas in the room in the back corner, so I'll give a little shout out to them, uh, Jill and Becky, and they're here joining us as well. So uh, we're going to dive right in, and I'm assuming that everybody that's on the uh, extension sites can hear me. I've got my microphone on, so if something else uh, comes up where we have technology issues, just shout out. Um, so uh, what makes a thriving student? And I just clicked two too fast through on that, but uh, give me a sense from the room. When I say a student who's thriving, um, what comes to mind for you about characteristics of that particular student? What are some of the things that you know about your students when you know that they're thriving? What are the things you see them doing? Or what are the characteristics that they bring to campus? Yeah. They're excited. They're excited. They hold their appointments. They hold their appointments, yeah. They feel connected. They feel connected. They engage in multiple resources. They engage in multiple resources around campus. 
adults. Yeah. For asking good questions. For asking questions. They're being curious university students. Yeah. They're happy. They're happy, yeah. They know why they're here. They know why they're here. They have a sense of purpose. Yeah. yeah. They bring in other people as well. They're the connection for... They draw other people into themselves. They're forming that sort of community around them. Yeah. What else? What are some of the other aspects of the students that you work with that you'd say, that's a thriving student on campus? This is what I see in them. They work hard without complaint. They work hard without complaint. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. They are well-rounded where they not only participate academically, but socially they're integrated. So they're well-rounded, they have social integration, they're not just here just focusing on uh, academics as if they have the siloed academic experience, but they're demonstrating sort of holistic interaction with the world around them. Sure. Yeah. They take the initiative. They take initiative, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who else, what else, what are the aspects of students? They're excelling and looking for those opportunities to find more, to do more. Sure. They're excelling, they're looking for new things to engage in. There's that sense of curiosity sometimes that's behind that, right? Where we see that they're just they're they're striving for something. Sometimes it's not just the A, perhaps. Maybe they're actually really trying to wrestle with something that they're learning. Like maybe that's uh, one of the signs that you see. We put a list up on the screen here, and there's certainly some of the things that we just heard that I've got on my bullets over here. But this was the sort of initial experience that we went through as a group of researchers when we said there's this. Thing out there that we want to better understand. There's this thing about the student experience that isn't just GPA or persistence. I'm going to talk about some student success outcomes in higher education in just a minute. There's something else going on. The motivational characteristic behind that was actually positive psychology. We're going to unpack that a little bit. How positive psychology, and in particular some of the work of folks like Martin Seligman, Corey Keyes, John Haight, some of those folks and their research really informed what we were thinking about with students, we were saying there's something more. There's something about the attitudes and motivations of students that help us understand student success. And we want to understand if we can measure that. We want to understand if that's a phenomenon that actually exists. And we want to understand if that phenomenon connects to other outcomes that matter to higher education, like GPAs, like persistence, like graduation. That was really the sort of origin, nexus, genesis place 10 years ago when a group of us got together to say, can we explore this phenomenon? Uh, and what would, it, what would it look like to actually do so? So I want to define student success. I did this uh, same slide exercise earlier with a group uh, where we were working on some of our Civitas tools, and it's, it's always astounding to me. So my PhD is in uh, student success in higher education. People say, I didn't even know you could study that. And I was like, neither did I. Uh, but, I but I went and studied that, and in, in particular in the school that I uh, did my doctoral work in, it's a program that's in the School of Behavioral Human Sciences. It's not in the School of Education, which is really fascinating. And I think for us uh, in that program, that uh, uh, correlates in large part to why this kind of research has come out of that work, because most of my faculty members actually were community, community psychologists. Uh, and so I, I get to travel around the world, travel a lot around the country, and talk about student success. And what I find really interesting is that there's not a universal definition of student success. I'm going to put a few things up on the board that are probably the, the main themes that we hear in student success, but it's not universal. It's not just about college completion any longer. Certainly, persistence uh, and graduation are important elements of student success because students are not completing programs of study if they're not persisting term over term. Students who are not persisting are not graduating. We've created a whole structure in higher education that says that if you study these courses, you can get this piece of paper that says that you have this thing called a bachelor's degree. You can go further, do some more study, defend a, a thesis, and have a master's degree. You can do further study and go even in further depth towards something that's really narrow in the world, defend a dissertation, and get a doctorate. We've said those things, and, and at the end of the day, those are markers of student success. Completion is an important marker of student success, but it's not the only marker that's out there. We've increasingly seen uh, conversations around learning gains or learning outcomes. If you're really interested in this work, John Tagg's work on deep learning is really fascinating. Uh, in particular, he had a couple articles in About Campus, maybe about 15 years ago, where he talked about this idea of what deep learning means. Uh, and if you've been animated at all in your reading by folks like Mihail Csikszentmihalyi uh, and this idea of flow, he talks about uh, from the positive psych world, a lot of that kind of leans into Tagg and Barr's work on deep learning where students are you know, demonstrating to us that they're really pressing into what they're learning. They're experiencing timelessness as they're doing so. 
And perhaps that's a student success measure. We talked about the kind of animating curiosity that drives students who are thriving uh, into learning something new. These are potentially students who experiment with different courses, even courses where they're maybe afraid that they're not going to get the A. And that student is actually even willing to get a lower grade because they really set out to try to learn something, to really wrestle with a concept. Uh, and perhaps that learning gain is that ultimate indicator of student success in that case. We also see that sense of belonging is increasingly a part of the conversation in student success. Uh, in the literature in higher ed, you're going to see a lot of this uh, surrounding Sylvia Hurtado's work on sense of belonging in particular around uh, Latino and Latina student experiences uh, on American campuses. I'm going to talk a little bit later about a psychological sense of community and some of the work that we've been doing around that construct that I think can really amplify this notion of sense of belonging. But again, this is a student success measure, in particular for underrepresented and underserved populations in, in America, where we'd say, if, if, if uh, college isn't for this group historically, what are we doing now to help them experience success on campus? And if they're leaving because they don't feel a sense of belonging, then we're failing them. Something for me? Okay. Uh, engagement. We're increasingly seeing engagement uh, as a conversation in the national literature. Uh, George Koo and his colleagues at Indiana University of Bloomington have been really the pioneers in bringing that to the forefront through the NESI work. And so that's the National Survey for Student Engagement. Really, that's an extension of the work that was done at UCLA by Pace and Aston in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, looking at this idea of student involvement on campus and its connection to outcomes that matter in higher ed. Uh, and so really what we're looking at with, with Ku and his colleagues, they talked about this idea of educationally purposeful activities that students participate in that are demonstrative of their engagement in their curriculum material that lead to outcomes that matter. Lastly, my colleague, Lori Schreiner, uh, her work on satisfaction, we're increasingly seeing satisfaction as a marker of student success in college, especially from legislative environments where they're really interested in understanding our publicly funded institutions in particular serving whatever the needs are for that area. So you look at access-oriented institutions where they're not just offering diploma programs, but perhaps just continued learning. Continued learning. Uh, and is that satisfying the needs of a local area as an educational outlet uh, and increasingly, I think, in student affairs in particular, we're curious to just know if our students are satisfied here. Because the last, the last thing I, I would want to see is when I was the vice president of student affairs, is a student just persisting term over term or throughout the course of his or her term who says, I really hate it here. I really don't like any of the programs. I really don't like any of my peers. Uh, at the end of the day, they're spending their, their hard-earned money. They're spending their time and their energy to be a part of our community. And I, I would like to think that, uh, sort of my, again, my rose-colored glasses as an educator, that we would say that satisfaction does matter. That we want them to be satisfied with the experience. When we think about these, these are some of the pillars of student success that I've sort of seen in the literature in the last decade or so. Um, and I use them just as a bit of a level setting tool just to say that student success is not just this monolithic thing of whether or not students are graduating or not. It's a part of the conversation. But it's really more complex than that. And that means that solving student success in higher education is a lot more complex than just firing a silver bullet. From I said to the group this morning, that uh, the tools that we create at Civitas, for example, are not silver bullet solutions. And people who think that student success can be solved with a silver bullet, run for the hills, folks, because it just doesn't, it just is not true. So I want to talk a little bit about the emphasis on behavior in higher education. So again, I'm a scholar of, of the higher education lit. And if you are studying higher ed, uh, you've probably read some of these kinds of, of literature. And if not, then I'm going to throw some different citations up here that you can explore that I think are, are uh, helpful in kind of setting the tone for why we think behavior matters in higher ed. Why have we focused on it? Um, so again, I mentioned uh, the work of Pace at UCLA. And, and his foundational work in understanding student behaviors in higher education was really around quality of work. And it shouldn't seem as a, a, a real surprise to us that what he found was that the more effort that students put toward their studies, the better they tended to do in college. Um, but at some point, someone had to study that and actually make that assertion and figure out what the theory was behind that work. Uh, and that quality of, of effort led to then Alexander Astin's work on student involvement theory. So Astin and Pace were counterparts uh, in their time at, uh, early on at UCLA. Uh, Alexander Astin, faculty emeritus now at UCLA, he's the number one cited researcher in the higher education lit. Um, and little known side fact, his brother was Gomez on the Adams family. Um, 
But, and so if you see Alexander Astin, if you see Dr. Astin, I actually got to go through a TSA line recently with him in Ohio. He has no idea who I am. I've met him a couple times, but uh, he looks like a big old Gomez. Uh, and he's a really gentle soul, uh, really wonderful to listen to. And a lot of his work has really been foundational in higher education because it really, it really says when, when we get students involved with things that matter to them and matter to the academy, they can be more successful than not. So it's really kind of fascinating work. And a lot of his work, this foundational stuff, is from his 1984 citation. Uh, on uh, four critical years. And then I talked a little bit about George Kuh and this idea of involvement or engagement in campus. So taking that involvement to that next level. Not just saying what are they doing, but which of those things that they're doing actually lead to outcomes that matter. So again, Kuh, Kuh and, and uh, Jillian Kinsey and their colleagues, Alex McCormick, other folks like that, they talk about these educationally purposeful activities that lead students to outcomes that matter. Uh, and so uh, Kuh, Kinsey, Shu, and Witt, they're publication from a number of years ago it should be foundational. It should be on everyone's reading list. It's been updated. It still has a little bit of, of some dated things in it, but it really is a foundational, easy read to begin to, to level set around what they're talking about with regard to engagement and why engagement seems to matter in higher education. So why thriving? So I sort of set the stage on what is student success. I sort of asked you a little bit about like what do thriving students look like in your world? We gave some ideas. And, and if you're anything like me, when you interact with students who you'd say, yeah, that's a thriving student, the more you interact with those students, probably the more excited you are to do your work. Um, so that was certainly a little bit animating for us when we started early on. There were some faculty members uh, who were pure faculty members on our research team. And they're just like, yeah, like those are the kinds of students I want to teach. I want to figure out what that is and figure out how to get more of that. There were some of us that had that student affairs world lens. And I'm kind of like Mr. Holistic, give me a hug. And I'm just like, I just really care about the well-being of my students. And so that was really what drew uh, me into thriving and the work therein. But why thriving? We really wanted to expand this definition of student success. We really felt as though that some of those student success definitions that, we, that I showed you earlier really kind of pigeonhole the work that we're doing with students. Um, so if we're just really looking at persistence and just looking at graduation or course completion, that that's pretty limiting. If we exclusively looked at sense of belonging, but students are finding a sense of belonging that's not connected to their academic studies, then what does it matter? They're here to get an education, so it should matter. Those other quality effort things should matter. They should be pressing into their studies. Higher education should change them in some way, should expand their knowledge. And so we really wanted to then incorporate this idea of psychological well-being as it connects to student success. And at the end of the day, we also wanted to explore this idea of optimal function. So we were looking at the human flourishing lit that Corey Keyes and John Haidt have out. There's probably a text in your library called Flourishing. I don't recommend buying it because it's about $400. But check it out from the library. It's really foundational in looking at what does the positive psych literature say about what is human flourishing? What is the optimal life experience? A lot of that literature is focused on elderly populations and children. So they focused on, on, on older folks and said, reflect back on your life. and Talk about times where you were really vibrantly living life. So they talk about flourishing in the context of the vibrant, in, the thriving individual in the vibrant community. And what does that actually look like? And our question was, is what does that mean in college for college students? So we conceptualized it this way. If you think about the learning gains that students are making in higher education, that that's the outcome that we can actually see. We talked a little bit about engagement, all the literature that's surrounding engagement and student engagement in higher education. And as researchers, we said, we don't want to poo-poo that. It actually is good research. It's important. And it's known to be connected to these outcomes that matter. But at the end of the day, if we're only waiting for that engagement to be an observable characteristic, did you do this thing? Did you study this thing? Did you go to the library? How many hours did you spend on an ex uh, studying for an exam, for example? At the end of the day, if we just wait to observe that, we've actually waited too late to impact a student who's not going to press into that level of engagement like a peer might. So we said there's a psychological characteristic that actually precedes the behaviors that we want to observe in students that are connected to the outcomes that matter. So it's this psychosocial, this motivational, attitudinal motivational characteristics that we really wanted to press into to say, are there preceding attitudes and motivations that help us better understand the engagement of students that connect to learning outcomes that matter? So this is how we conceptualized it. If we could really understand that attitudinal motivational characteristic, is it linked to engagement? Is it linked to a behavior that seems to matter? Because the literature tells us that those behaviors are connected to outcomes that matter. So then the corollary question to that was, if we also then can understand the psychological motivational characteristics without the engagement, what connection do they have to student success? How does that look for students? And how could that inform 
the practice that we have with students inside classroom environments, both in curricular and co-curricular environments on campus that connect us to the outcomes that matter that we're trying to explore. So that's really the foundation of why thriving. So again, we didn't want to then discount the work that's been in the literature in higher ed for 45 years on uh, student behaviors, but we were really animated with this idea of psychological motivation uh, and those characteristics. So again, I want to go back to then defining thriving. So this is actually a quote from Corey Keyes. So again, his literature is in the positive psych world on human flourishing. And we said to ourselves, this is really animating to us. We're really excited about this idea of flourishing people. Our question then was, what is a flourishing university student? And are there similar characteristics from the human flourishing lit that are specific to the domain of higher education, that student experience as they go through higher education? So again, this is the definition that Corey Keyes and John Haight give us in the flourishing literature, this idea of emotional vitality, positive functioning. These are flourishing individuals. So again, they asked elderly folks, reflect on your life, talk about that. Where, where did you experience this? And we have this rich uh, qualitative study material on human flourishing. And they went back and they said, can we observe this in children? Really fascinating work. If you're really interested in that early childhood development literature, that's a pretty fascinating uh, uh, connection between the positive psych world and early childhood development is to look at children and say how, before they get all jaded like the rest of us adults, how is it that students or little kids are experiencing emotional vitality and positive function? There was, a, there was a kind of a big gap in the middle though. And we said we want to fill that little gap by exploring the college student domain. And in doing so, we wanted to then call it thriving, to distinguish it from that literature on flourishing, to distinguish it from the exploration of children and the elderly, to really say, what is it about the student experience in college that helps us better understand what it means to be a flourishing student or a student who thrives? So this is, this is my definition of thriving from one of my pieces uh, in, in the literature. And I'll just leave that up there for a second to get that idea. So the other foundational piece that I'll, I'll throw out there when I when you think about this why thriving question, uh, John Bean and Siobhan Eaton had a chapter in John Braxton's book in 1999 uh, and that was really foundational for us, too, in understanding why we would explore these attitudinal motivational characteristics in student success. And in that book, John Braxton is essentially taking an extension of Vince Tinto's sociological theory on student retention and saying there's not just a sociological component of retention, there's a psychological component. And that psychological component actually then precedes the student's behaviors and motivation, uh, or their behaviors and actions. When we understand that, perhaps we could better understand departure. That was really the first time that the literature in student success lit said, hey, there's something about the psychological aspect of the student experience that we should be Any questions so far before I dive into what we actually mean when we're talking about thriving? This is a graphical representation of what our thriving model actually is. So what we actually then set out to do is to say, can we measure this phenomena so we can understand it theoretically? We believe that it theoretically exists uh, in the context of students. If there is flourishing in the human experience, then perhaps that flourishing experience, it does have a domain in college that students experience that. And might, how might we, might we go measure that? Uh, if you've taken any um, advanced statistics classes and done uh, instrument creation than some of this work you've, you've done. So we had to go through a huge pilot phase with, with a lot of data to begin to understand what are the elements that could help us understand a thriving student. And at the end of the day, we needed to compete those characteristics to say, can we measure this phenomena? But more so than that, is the phenomena that we're actually measuring demonstrated in the literature to be malleable to, to, to change? Uh, so we don't want to just measure a psychological phenomena that, that there's not a lot of evidence that you can actually change that characteristic. We said, let's measure the, the things that are amenable to change through intervention, and at the end of the day, also connect to outcomes that matter in higher education. So the way that we, that we assessed that was, do the items that we're measuring actually also help us predict things like GPA, persistence, and satisfaction? And that's where we got to this model. So what emerged is a five-factor model of thriving across these different factors that you see here. These factors then exist in three different domains. So there's an academic domain, so the engaged learning and the academic determination characteristics of the model fall in that academic domain. That's really what distinguishes this from just flourishing. 
then the other intrapersonal and interpersonal aspects of the model between positive perspective and social connectedness and then diverse citizenship saying um, there's, this, there's this thing about interacting with other, others and intrapersonal aspects of that domain. So think of this as five factors across three different domains. I want to dive into what we actually mean here. So if you want to read a little bit more on this, uh, uh, at the end of this slide uh, deck, I'm going to have our website on there where there's a list of our literature. But this is how we built these items. So we built these items out of uh, initially existing measurement items in the positive psych lit that said we can measure these things. And then as we did uh, both our pilot study, our final structural model proof, then we went back, we reworded items, did a bunch of focus groups, repiloted, retested, reproved the structural model. And that's where we're at today uh, in demonstrating our own 23 item survey for student five. So academic determination, this idea of self-regulated learning. So I know what, it, what I need to do on my own to be able to achieve the academic goal that's set before me. And then that's connected to this idea of effort, time management. So this idea of how much effort, again, back to Pace's work, what's that effort that I need to do in order to be able to achieve what it is before me? And do I have the sense of what kind of time that's going to take with that, that, that notion of can I then make the time in my world to actually do that? So where we, where we tend to not see this for students who have low academic determination, their life is a bit of a mess, right? Like they just don't know when to study, what to study, how to study. They probably are committing to too many things, so they're, they're probably overcommitted. They're perhaps working a couple of jobs off campus, and they're just really discombobulated about the world around them and saying, I just don't know what to study right now for that exam tomorrow. That's kind of the, the uh, amplification of a student who's low in academic determination. The last aspect of this is hope. Shane Lopez's work on academic hope is really fascinating stuff. He talks about hope as a function of way power and willpower, agency and pathway. And so students who have high academic hope have this sense of, this is my will to do the thing that I'm set before me, and I think I understand the way to get there. So he talks about that in that function of agency and pathway. You think about those students who you interact with who have low hope, right? They just don't have a sense of what's before them. They don't know what to do next. They don't know why they're doing that next. And so really that, that idea of, of, of academic hope that Shane Lopez brought to the literature uh, was really a foundational part of us uh, understanding this idea of academic determination. And engaged learning. Uh, so my colleague, Laura Schreiner, uh, and my other colleague and good friend, Michelle Lewis, developed the engaged learning index. And this is the idea, uh, the extent to which psychologically that learning is making the connections in the student's mind around the materials that they're learning. Are they connecting what they're learning in one class with what they're learning in the other? In what ways are they actually engaged in a particular lecture, for example. So are they meaningfully processing the things that they're learning and actually turning them into something that's going to cement in their mind for long-term learning outcomes? So this is this idea, then, of, of, of the focus that they have on the objectives that are there, this idea, again, of wrestling with ideas, connecting one thing to another. Uh, when I think about this uh, as an example in my world, I think of this, the low <laughs> engaged learning index is that business student in the first year who says, why do I have to take philosophy? And you're like, oh, brother, let's sit down and talk about what the foundations of liberal arts actually mean in your learning and why we think that that's important in our environment. So this idea of positive perspective, I'm going I'm to delve into this a little bit later. A lot of this is Marty Seligman's work on optimism and learned optimism. Uh, and I've got a slide later on what he actually means on that. And this idea of subjective well-being, John Haidt's work on subjective well-being, which somebody talked about uh, students are happy. And John Haidt would say it's not just a function of happiness, but it's been that full reflection of well-being within the context of happiness. Happiness is that secondary state. So you'd say we choose to be happy, but otherwise we experience that holistic sense of well-being and happiness can be an extension of that. And so John Haidt's work on this idea of positive perspective. These are students who would say that the glass is half full. Interestingly, when we measure thriving in incoming student populations, if we measure thriving before students start college, the number one predictor of end of term thriving is their incoming level of positive perspective. I'll say it again. If we want to measure end of term thriving in freshman students, and we've done this consistently, the number one indicator of end of first term thriving is their entry level characteristics around positive perspective. So they're optimistic about what's before them. And at the end of the term, this is coming in, so entry characteristics. Well, to address that, that one's out of our control. When they come in, yeah. that's out of our control. So how do we address that? Well, the question for those on the line is, I don't know if they can hear with the room, but how do we address that? The students are coming in with those entry characteristics. And you're right. 
the theory on, on student departure, especially Vince Sinto's theory and even John Braxton's theory would say, the students bring that to us. Then the, the reality is though, is that there's that whole middle part of their models that talks about the environmental characteristics we create on campus. So we, I'll, I'll fully agree with you. I can't respond to or change many students' entry level characteristics. I can't make a student older than, than they are, right? So I worked at a campus for a number of years where it was like, our men who were 17, who were the early graduating high school seniors, I mean, they were a disaster for us. They were a real problem when it came to maturity. And it was like, I just wanted to pull them aside and be like, if I could make you 19 years old, that would just make our life a heck of a lot easier. And I lived in a province where the drinking age was 18. And so imagine what happens when 17 year olds come to a university campus and turn 18 in November. Uh, and I can tell you what happened, because I was a dean of students there for years. Uh, and so we can't, we can't change it, but we can respond to it. And that's where when, uh, when I talk about Marty Seligman's learned optimism, what Marty's work says that we can teach optimism. We can teach people what he calls an optimistic explanatory style. It's through things like reframing, helping them see that the glass doesn't need to be always half empty, but we can retrain them and reorient them. Here's the challenge though, folks. What we're talking about here are psychological characteristics. And the cyclet will tell you very compellingly, and our research will confirm this, our psychological characteristics are reasonably stable over time. For those of us who are not off the mental health spectrum, we're in a spectrum that's otherwise in the, in the broad aspects of general mental wellness, we have fairly stable psychological characteristics. So those that are amenable to change, what we've found consistently in our work on student thriving is that it takes many simple touch points that are consistent over time in order to shift those kinds of things. So teaching an optimistic explanatory, explanatory style is possible. It takes time and effort. Right? It takes intentionality. The question really that I would have though is, how many campuses know which students coming in are really optimistic about their first term? So if we gotta start there, we gotta even understand where they're at, because what we know is those who come in at a high level are most likely to thrive at the end of the term. That's gonna be connected to their likelihood to persist, the GPA and their satisfaction. And what we can say categorically is that the ones we've studied come in with low levels of optimism, have lower levels of thriving, they have lower GPAs, they tend not to come back, and they tend not to be as satisfied with their experiences. Another aspect in our model, diverse citizenship. So this idea that I interact with others who are different than me, and that is a good thing. That our differences are a part of how we appreciate one another, how we learn, and that it doesn't necessarily mean that I adopt your views, but that I recognize that your views, your life experiences differ from my own, and that through learning together, we benefit as a community and as individuals. Social connectedness, positive relations, and connection with friends. This seems like a fairly natural understanding. If you study student development theory, if you work in student affairs here, you'd say, yeah, this is what we're trying to do in college. We're trying to create positive relationships that matter. And in our measurement, it's not just positive relationships in my life, it's on this campus. So it's domain specific. So we're not just asking students, do you have positive relationships? Do you have friends in your life? We say to them, do you have them on your campus? Because that, we find, matters. That makes a difference. So I talked a little bit about sense of belonging. I talked about uh, Sylvia Hurtado, uh, Hurtado and Carter's work on sense of belonging and its connection to the, the literature on Latino and Latina students. Um, what's interesting in our work is that we were fascinated by this idea of sense of community, primarily because Lori Schreiner, this is sort of her sandbox. She wrote the Psychological Sense of Community on Campus Index in the late 70s, and she was like, psychological sense of community. This is this phenomena that comes to us out of community cyclet, in particular the work of Sarason and others uh, in defining what it means to be in community with one another. Um, it, it, foundational to my understanding of this was Viktor Frankl's work. So if you've read Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, I mean, this is kind of the foundation of like, he basically says that human beings are a collective species. We, we, we thrive in community with one another. That we are absolutely oriented toward being around one another and that that's a, that's a vibrant part of the human experience. And interestingly, he was a Holocaust survivor, so if you're not familiar with Viktor Frankl's story, so he's got a really specific lens through which he was looking at that. Uh, and so Man's Search for Meaning is a great read on that. Uh, so what Lori thought when we were initially looking at thriving, she said a psychological sense of community is a part of thriving. She's like, I'm certain of it. It has to be. And she had spent 25 years studying this phenomenon on college campuses. She 
because it has to be a part of this idea of what it means to be a thriving college student. And so we, inst we instrumented then our measurement of psychological sense of community. If you're a psychometrician, this has an alpha of like 0.94. This is a super stable element. We can measure this time and time again with great stability. We would go in and do a confirmatory factor analysis, which is a statistical technique to understand the extent to which these elements hold together and measure a phenomena that we think we're measuring. And every time, anything that included PSC didn't account for anything on thriving. It didn't fit the model. The model that I just showed you with those five factor items, that was what emerged time and time again to statistically demonstrate that there was a thing called thriving that is greater than the sum of just its parts, those five different factors that I showed you. And a psychological sense of community, we could measure it stably as its own phenomena. We could, con we could confirm that phenomena through a confirmatory factor analysis. But anytime we said to the statistical program, we think this is also pointing into this thing we're calling thriving, the statistical program said, no, it does not fit the data. It, it, we're talking uh, across 100 different campuses, 30,000 different student surveys, never once, no good fit. I did this across every kind of student group, men and women, students of color, white students, international students, no fit, grad students, undergrad students. What we found consistently is that a psychological sense of community is the number one predictor of variation in thriving. We found that every time we've measured thriving in the psychological sense of community. If we really want to understand variation in thriving, the predictor variable for variation in thriving is a student's psychological sense of community on campus. So what that means is that's not just the sense of belonging that Hurtado and Carter are talking about. That's in that membership component. So the membership component of a psychological sense of community is a sense of belonging. I'm a member here and I I know what that means here, but it also has this idea of influence, integration, fulfillment of need, and shared emotional connection that lacks in the sense of belonging literature. So the sense of, uh, psychological sense of community uh, concept comes out of the community psych lit, sense of belonging comes out of the higher ed lit, and what we find really fascinating is that we say, yes, sense of belonging matters, but so do these other things in the context of a community in college. And what we know is that that's predictive of variation in thriving for students when they're experiencing a psychological sense of community, they're more likely to be thriving students. Okay? So what we mean here are, uh, again, this membership component. Talk to me about what it means to be a member of this campus community. How do students know that they are a member? Yeah. You tell me what level, so, yeah. Anybody here in, from admissions? Anyone in, in, in admissions work? So I'll give you a sense from a membership perspective. At the admissions level, we tell them you've been accepted. That's how you start. You have accepted your application to attend university. You are now, you are now could enter into the context of the community. So is the beginning that you really are a part of yeah, you've been accepted, Absolutely. but once they get their student ID card. Getting that student ID card, right, tells me something. It tells me that I am set apart from a person in the broader community of Logan who doesn't have that ID card. It makes it, that makes a difference. The totem of membership. Anything else? Social media. So they can join the different affinity groups in their social media. They can put it on their profile, and they can say, I am a student here. Absolutely. Uh, clubs and organizations? We, we have, so part of the admissions process, I mean, we have the slogan, I'm an Aggie, right? Mm -hmm. This was a big uh, marketing push for a lot of years. We'd send out these little um, things that they'd hold up when they got accepted, I'm an Aggie. When we bring them to campus, some things that have gone on that I think really help to instill it. We talk about the Aggie family, and um, there's a lot of tradition surrounding this. And students that um, are game for it, participate in those traditions, and those traditions make them feel like they're part of the community. Of course, we have a whole subsection of students that aren't, aren't on that level, that don't do the traditions, or don't participate, or take. And so there, there is this kind of sense of the Aggie family, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the Aggie family is, and I don't know, maybe other people can speak to this, the Aggie family is, I don't believe, a comprehensive family. It's, a, it's those who, who show up. And then there's a set, subsection that don't. And yeah. there's the institutional driven initiatives, and then there's the student. We have true Aggies here. That's a student, like that's a lore, it's a lore 
you know, these grassroots phenomena. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Anyone else? What you've alluded to here is this idea of the fact that not everyone on campus gets to experience these things. Sometimes what we actually find is that our own traditions and history are driving away the possibilities for some students to engage in that. I'll give you a quick example. You mentioned Aggies, so some good friends of mine. They were the consultants who were brought into Texas A&M after the big fire. So if you remember from a number of years ago, there was Texas A&M used to have what they call their fish camps every fall, and they were basically like frosh week. And then they would have the big fire. The big fire, we're talking, we do things big in Texas. Right? And this big fire, I mean, it's like the size of five houses. It's a big bonfire. Uh, Jill, are you a Texan A&M grad? She went there freshman year, so she experienced the fish camp. Uh, and so what happened was the bonfire collapsed, and some students died. And there was a soul-searching exercise at Texas A&M that said, perhaps we need to really examine why we do this and what it's really all about. And some friends of mine went in and they did some cultural audits. And what they found was then that that experience in and of itself for some was a huge aspect of how that, those students began to experience membership in the community. But they found out also that it was highly exclusionary for others. The connection to this idea of a psychological sense of community goes beyond just a sense of belonging because there's this idea of influence. When I'm a part of this community, can I change it? And if I don't even feel like I'm a member here, what's the likelihood of me experiencing that kind of phenomenon? And do I experience integration and a fulfillment of need? Is there something in my life that being part of this community actually serves as a purpose in my life that I can tangibly reflect upon? The idea of shared emotional connection. Do I have friendships on here that really matter to me on this campus? Uh, so one of the items in this, in this uh, part of our survey instrument is I feel like belonging. It's that simple. Um, you know, I have friendships that matter. Uh, and so this idea of a psychological sense of community on campus, I think, is a really vital space to think about how it is that we help students on pathways toward thriving as opposed to away from thriving. Some of the liter literature that we have on Asian students' experience in higher education in America, in particular Mitchell Chang's work, he calls it the Asian evasion. Why? He says, we don't study Asian students because monolithically as a group, they tend to persist and graduate at, at, at numbers that are better than, than even their Caucasian counterparts. So we just think, there's nothing wrong with them. You know what happens when we study a psychological sense of community for Asian students in higher education in America? They have some of the worst senses of community on campuses in America. So I would say we're not serving those students well when they're graduating from here, going off into the workforce, and yeah, they got uh, better grades than others and their graduation rates are better than others, but they're not reflecting back on these experiences on campus as something that was positive to them, I would say we missed the problem. So, so that brings me to a question. Yeah. This is Erin and Tooele. And I, so one of the things you just brought up a moment ago was Viktor Frankl. And for Frankl and others, they would say that this is really about a concept of meaning making for students. Um, and that that is highly subjective. And so how do we, or did your study have anything to address this idea that a psychological sense of community is going to be very different student to student or, or between large groups of students, particularly working with regional campuses um, there's very little research or study about adult learners and non-traditional, what we have traditionally called non-traditional students. Um, and we know some things about what they need, but we haven't necessarily got some great roadmaps for creating psychological sense of community for adult students. That's a great question. So on the, on the path of meaning making, that's actually another part of the model that's coming. So we're going to get there on the idea of meaning making. That's actually the depth of my research is specifically around the differences on meaning making in particular for different students of color groups across the studies that we've done. Um, but uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and there's some interesting studies that have been out there on this idea of safeguarding a psychological sense of community. I'm actually uh, signing off on a particular uh, grant application this week uh, with a colleague out of Wisconsin. And he's trying to replicate a study where uh, in that particular study, they took a group of incoming African-American computer science majors 
uh, and they had attempted to safeguard a sense of community uh, by sending different positive oriented messages to these students on a regular basis. Uh, and so he's going to be trying to replicate that study on his campus. Uh, and uh, so he's, he's pretty excited about that because he wants to then bring that back into the thriving model and actually look at it from an A-B test perspective. If we just send students some materials uh, that just says, hey, you're a student here, here's some things, and we send these other students different messages about who they are and how they can press into these uh, aspects of their, of their life in the community together, and also send them things like totems, like a campus uh, uh, team hats and other different swag material, sorry, promotional material if we have marketing people here. Um, that if it, perhaps that's how we can begin to safeguard a sense of community, and he's actually going to replicate that study and attempt to do that fairly broadly on an entire campus. Uh, so that so we're 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 trying to figure out some of those those avenues, and we're really at this place right now where we've we've demonstrated and statistically proven the instrument, its both validity uh, and stability to measure this phenomenon we call thriving, and we're really now working uh, to advance things. Uh, institutional partners with us who are saying we want to try and test this, we want to be measuring this in our incoming students, we want to be then saying we want to design interventions specifically targeted at reaching out to students to build things like sense of community, to lead them toward aspects of thriving. Optimism studies is another area where we think learned optimism, we'll talk about that in a little while, uh, is, is another avenue to really think about this. Uh, and so that's really where we're at next, is what does that look like for adult students? What does it look like for online students? I've got one student right now out of Florida, he works at a large online university. And he's saying, how can I build a sense of community in an online college of adult learners? And I'm like, Good luck, Andrew. Um, but he's trying and he's taking the theoretical lens and he's going to say, I'm going to try to do this because I'm a director of student success at this college. And he's like, I think we can serve our students better by at least attempting something and doing some try and test things and thinking of that in mind. So that's where this psychological sense of community, I think, is really important because, again, it, it's where I think we can create the, the optimal opportunities for students to sort of pre-prime the pump on thriving, if you will. We know that, it, again, it's the number one predictor of variation in thriving. Uh, and I think that there's lots of opportunities in areas of campus that already exist. When we think about what does it really mean to experience any of these four, four aspects here on this campus, and what are some of the things we're doing right now that perhaps don't include everyone? So I just want to unpack these really quickly with some, some depth of slides. So again, I think this is where your opportunity really exists when you're thinking about thriving as a student outcome. I think impacting a psychological sense of community is probably the easier lift area initially. So this is this idea of, of membership uh, and what this really means here. Again, this idea of, of, of totems. What is it that we say to our students? How do we message that, they, that they're a member here or not a member here? Uh, and what are the things that we do? Uh, even through things like campus signage, I think, is a big part of, of membership. Do I know the terminology here? Do, does everybody speak an acronym and I don't understand it? So right out of the gate, I'm just told, I'm not a member here. Um, how, do you, how do you interact with, say, international students or students who aren't from the Logan region? And, and, and one, of the, one of the things that I have been sort of on a soapbox with people about, and this comes back from my student affairs days, is, you know, do you say to your international students, like, do you feel welcome here? Like, do you feel welcome here? Um, I'm a guest here today. You can ask me that, because I'm a guest. I hope that you could are getting beyond just asking your international students if they feel welcome. Because they are supposed to belong here. You admitted them and they're coming, right? And so, and I say that and it's not a pejorative thing because we did it too at my institution and, and I, I'm just as guilty of it. But I think it's a simple example of saying like, we don't welcome our family members into our home for Thanksgiving and then sit at the table and say like, so do you feel welcome here? Like maybe we do if you've got a really dysfunctional family. But at the end of the day you think, this is my family. I belong here. I'm supposed to be here. It's Thanksgiving. That's why I'm here. I'm not just a guest. And so what is it that we even say? What is it that we do? How do we reinforce that and invite them into that vibrant community that I think most campuses are really tempted to build? This idea of influence is bi-directional. So this is when you're thinking about students, what is it that they can actually be called into to affect the culture on this campus? Uh, and so part of this is structural at times, it can be policy driven. Um, you know, and what is, what again, what are the messages that you're saying to students that you can actually have an influence here? I think we can do that at the individual level, so I think departments can really begin to do this. Shaping, for example, the learning experience, um, and talking to students about what this really could mean about influencing one another in the context of community. Uh, the broader gets a little bit harder and a little more obtuse, like, you know, do students actually have opportunities to speak to leadership, and can that actually be seen as influential? Again, this inter interdependent concept, 
Um, so do we have integration and fulfillment of need? Is there something here that I need that you also need? And we perceive that that's sort of symbiotic in a way that's healthy uh, and helpful in understanding my connection to my community. And then shared emotional connections. So are we doing things that bond us together? Do we have these common experiences? And, and hopefully, I mean, when I think about my time, I used to, uh, when I first started off in student affairs, I was a hall director at a university. Uh, and so when you think about, like, if you lived in residence at all during your undergraduate career, I mean, like, to me, that's, like, shared emotional connection. Like, we survived the blackout of 98, man. Like, and we had to go down to the cafeteria and eat in the dark, and it was great. And, like, there's a shared emotional connection because we went through these things together. Um, but are we creating some space to do that? And I would argue that sometimes the larger the organization, we kind of get departed from that. We kind of go through the motions of just running the university, and we don't think about this as shared emotional connection with our students, that they're investing time and energy and resource, uh, and that we can give that into them in a way that's, that, that we can also then learn back from, from them as well, and are we creating space to do this? When we talk about our thriving model, there's some other elements that then enter this measurement model of thriving. Uh, one of them is campus involvements. We talked a little bit about that before the extent to which students are involved. And when we measure this, we look at this as a function of both just general activity of involvement. Do they say that they're involved with things on campus? But also as a function of leadership. Are they taking roles of leadership on campus? Uh, in particular, then, for uh, other uh, minority group students, it's looking at involvement in minority groups of affinity. So we ask that around things like Black Student Association, LGBTQ advocacy groups. Uh, and are they not only then involved, but potentially taking um, leadership roles, and what we found, interestingly, in some of the work that I've done, campus involvement for African American students is one of the number one behavioral predictors of psych psychological sense of community and of thriving. More so statistically than for other uh, racial ethnic groups. Student faculty interaction. Uh, so, uh, really some fascinating work there. I love the work of Darnell Cole uh, in particular, I'll call that out. So, Darnell Cole is at USC. Uh, he talks about this idea of uh, this, where faculty and students are interacting and the importance of the kinds of conversations that they're having. And he basically says, in particular, Darnell is an African American, uh, and he says that uh, when, you're, when you're interacting with students who are not part of the ethnic majority or racial majority groups, don't just talk about what they need to do to remediate the work that they haven't done right. What they really need to hear from you is that they belong here, that they can do it, and that these are the kinds of supports that are in place to help them. And he's done some really fascinating stuff on this idea of student faculty interaction, specifically around students who are not part of the majority culture. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of well-meaning faculty in this world who really want their non-dominant culture students to succeed. And what they fall back to is, this is how you need to do it better so you can do it right in the class. And when you think and overlay that, with some of the other stuff that we read about of stereotype threat or imposter syndrome. And I think well-meaning, especially faculty of majority culture, and I'm talking to myself here, white men in particular, I think when we say that to students who don't look like us, what they hear is, I'm not good enough. And I think that we need to start to change our messages to open them into that invitation of saying, you are here, you matter, you can do this, this is hard, these are all the resources there. Tell me a little about your story. Why are you here, and how can I help you be the best person that you're becoming? I'm sorry, like, if that sounds really romantically rose-colored. That's why I got into education, because I really do believe that at the end of the day, when we create those opportunities, our students will surprise us time and time again by stepping into the challenge of demonstrating to us who they're capable of becoming. And I think that all too often, especially those of us who are in the academy, there's not a lot of people that go into this world to get a PhD, and I don't recommend it for everyone because it's really kind of silly when you think about it. Um, the vast majority of our students aren't like us that way. A very small group of our students will go on and get PhDs and become professors. The rest are here to learn, to go out into the world, and to have non-academic jobs. And so we can't just treat them like we were navigating our own experience and saying, oh, I just knew how to do this, and it was just easy for me, or I figured that out. So that's a lot of what Darno Cole is talking about, is really putting ourselves in their shoes, and really helping them hear a narrative that's different, that's really catered to who they are. The last piece is this idea of institutional integrity. Uh, John Braxton has talked about this idea of institutional welfare and institutional integrity, and we've been measuring these the last three years in our model of thriving. So he talks about welfare as this sense of 
Uh, do I feel like I'm treated as an individual on this campus? Questions are things like, when I interact with people in the registrar's office, I feel like I'm treated as a person. Kind of fascinating. Um, I always thought, and if there's people from the registrar's office, my apologies. Um, when I was a student, the registrar's office wasn't the most congenial to like a great conversation or a hug. Uh, there was Lois, and she worked at the registrar's office at my institution. It was Lois, so if you brought the 17 carbon form triplicate, quadruplicate form to her without the right initial from the right dean, it was like you'd stood in line for an hour and she'd be like, no, you need to go find Dean Wilson. And then you had to go find Dean Wilson and get the signature. So he's saying basically when, when our students experience our different functions around campus, uh, they feel treated like a human being, like not just a number. Interestingly, I was certain this was going to be part of a thriving model. And it's not. And I think what's actually happening here, I think, this is my hypothesis, is that increasingly since I went to campus 20, to a school 20 years ago, a lot of campuses are looking at this and saying, we just need to treat students a little more like human beings. I think we're getting better at that. Uh, and so I think students are actually coming here having realistic expectations that, yeah, when you're on campus with 20,000 people, the person behind the wicket can't know your name. But they won't just treat you like a number anymore. They will try to engage you. I think we're doing a lot better by that. What's interesting, though, is that his aspect of institutional integrity does hold in our model. And integrity, he says, is this. Is this campus providing me what they told me they were going to provide me through their promotional materials in particular? So this is this idea of what did I anticipate I was getting and what did I actually get? And we find that that actually does hold structurally in our model of student thriving. That when we are disconnected with what we tell students they're going to get between what they actually get, the further we are away from that, the less likely they are to thrive. So that's actually an interesting aspect of our model in the last three years that we kind of did try and test, and now integrity is a consistent part of our model. I want to get to this idea of meaning making. I'm putting the term spirituality up here, and I'm going to put a big asterisk next to this and say spirituality and religion are two different things. When I'm talking about spirituality, I'm talking about the way it's defined here by Aston, Aston, and Lindholm. If you haven't read this book and you're interested in the idea of meaning making or student spirituality or the way that we make meaning in the world, this is a must read for anyone in higher education. This is the foundational book uh, for my dissertation and really is an extension of, of a whole ton of work at UCLA under the College Student Beliefs and Values work, which has studied uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of students over the course of the last 30 or 40 years, and in particular, looking at religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, spiritual practices, religious uh, orientations, uh, and Aston, Aston, and Lindholm wrapped that up into a really nice book in 2011 that came up from Josie Bass. This is a must read uh, on your shelf if you're interested in that. For me, it was foundational. Again, in my, in my research, I was specifically looking at my dissertation study at the pathways to thriving for students of color. And what I found was that spirituality consistently for non-dominant culture students was statistically significant. It was statistically significant for Caucasian students too, but not to the strength that it was for the, for the students of color. And the, the, what, I've, what I think about this uh, in the context of, uh, of our work with students is that we don't think about student meaning making in connection to student success in most cases. Partly because um, I think in the academy we think of the academic self, the personal self, and then the spiritual self. And they shall the three sort of very much interact. They're sort of the professor who can kind of not just be the teaching research machine who might hang out with students on the weekend, but I don't typically talk about my religious life, my spiritual life, the meaning making that I have in my own world, because that might get like too personal and like my religious overtones may come in there because my spirituality and my religiosity are kind of enmeshed. And so instead I just teach. And I do my spiritual things, you do your spiritual things, and isn't that wonderful? And what we see in the UCLA study time and time again is that it doesn't matter what kind of institution you're at, it doesn't matter what your religious orientation is, a vast majority of college faculty and a vast majority of college students will say that they're spiritual beings. Over around 90%. Interesting, right? So I think of this as an avenue to talk about meaning making in the world with students and connecting that to their success. Fascinatingly, I'm going to put up a quote in a sec by Robert Nash. He's an atheist, and he studies this phenomenon. He's really interested in creating what he calls the opportunity to have conversations around hot topics on campus. And he says one of them is religion and spirituality. And when we don't do that, we're denying our students opportunities to be their authentic selves on our campus. 
and we're denying that of our faculty and staff. Interesting. So again, meaning making has consistently for us been a significant pathway to understanding thriving for students of color. And I then say, there's an article that I wrote in About Campus a couple years ago, where I basically said, we're not thinking about this as an opportunity of expression, in particular for our students of color, when we know that it's substantially connected to their ability to thrive on campus. So how could we draw them into that conversation? And I make the argument for our friends who are at religiously affiliated institutions that what we tend to do is we pigeonhole the religious and spiritual experiences of our students. And we say, if your narrative doesn't fit this, you don't belong and don't talk about that. So uh, interestingly, we did a study where we did, um, uh, we looked at thriving, uh, pre-term pre, pre thriving, post-term thriving on religiously affiliated schools, um, all coming out of the Protestant uh, tradition across uh, North America. I think there were six schools there. Uh, and what we, what we did is we wanted to do qualitative follow-up of the biggest change in the thrivers. So we took the top 10 who dropped the most, top 10 who gained the most in their thriving. We went back and we interviewed them qualitatively. So it's 120-ish that we went and tried to do qualitative follow-up with. Obviously, didn't get to everybody, but got to a wide swath of them. One fascinating anecdote that came out of that for a particular student who was Catholic, Latina, at a Southern Baptist institution. And she was, she was one of these high-change thrivers. She had gone from moderately thriving to high thriving in her first term. And what she basically told us was, on this campus, spiritual matters matter. And I am a better Catholic because of the that I interact with on this campus. And I'm like going back to our friends in the faith-based higher ed community and saying, yes, you can be at a Southern Baptist institution and have a different flavor of your faith that you can actually enliven and be a thriving individual on this campus and not necessarily resonate with the theology of that campus. But if we don't create the verticals where students can actually express that, you know, and when I'm talking to some folks in this room, I'm just gonna call the elephant out in the room. There are some LDS folks in this room and I know that there are challenges at places like BYU, because I've talked to friends who have gone there who say, I'm not even certain I can openly question my faith for fear of. How does that student thrive on our campus, folks? I mean, I'm just going to call that out there, and I've worked in Christian higher ed and done the same thing, where I'm just like, why can't we call into that experience the fact that we all have questions about what we believe in this world, and that we would like to think, at least I would like to think, that when we look at Fowler's uh, spiritual identity formation, that, that part of that is a big part of questioning, and we're looking at, in particular, traditional college-age students. They're wondering, what is my role in this world? Who am I? What am I becoming? Why am I here? These are the big questions of life, and our atheist students are asking them, too. And we need to all step into it with this, I think, open posture of saying, you're asking deep questions about meaning-making in the world. Look at the millennial generation. They're the most social justice-oriented group that we've seen in a long time. That's a part of deep meaning making. If we don't connect that to their learning, I dare say we're not going to be connecting them to a thriving experience in university. And that's just a deep part of meaning making. And it doesn't have to mean that every social justice oriented millennial uh, is, is a Christian or isn't a Christian or is a Muslim or isn't a Muslim. But they're finding deep meaning making and connecting the things that they do in the world with something that matters to them. So Frederick Beekner. Uh, he's a theologian, and I always struggle to use theologians in this example, but I love the example that he talks about. He says, basically, where, you're, you, where you can find the most meaning in the world is where your deepest gladness meets the world's greatest need. Where your deep gladness meets the world's greatest need. And I think about, for me, going into education, I want to find that sweet spot for every student I work with. I want to say, what are you really passionate about? Really passionate about kids, and I really want to express that in the context of an elementary classroom. You need to be a teacher. You need, to, you need to think about what it is that you need to do that's going to equip you to be the best teacher in the world, graduate from this institution, go get a job as a teacher, and just absolutely pour into the lives of the kids in your elementary school and just do that. Isn't that great? That's deep meaning making as an expression for that particular student in their trajectory of learning. Before I talk through this, any other questions that kind of emerge from that? So I like, again, I would like to distinguish this idea of meaning making and spirituality from religiosity. We tend to, as individuals, have enmeshment of our own religious practices with our own spiritual identity, and that's very normal. The literature would say that that's very, very normal. If you're a person who says, I am religiously oriented this way, then spiritually you probably will have some other alignments around that same orientation, and the expression of that religiosity is the connection to the institution that expresses that spirituality. 
they're not always interconnected. We're not BYU, but we do have 80% of our students, I mean, that's anecdotally, mm -hmm. it's, it's an estimate, 80% of the students are of one faith, the religious majority of the state. Yeah. And so at Utah State, I, I have seen this um, almost like a fear that if, if as a staff member or as a faculty member at the institution, if I even start to broach the topic of spirituality, there's trigger warnings in some of our students of if this person at this school in this climate of 80% is bringing up that topic, they must be exclusively doing it in order to favor that denomination. Yeah. And from that dom denominational perspective. And, and so there's almost even a, a, a sense of, I can't, even, I can't even begin to discuss that because even bringing it up will seem to be taking a side. Yeah. Does that make sense? How, totally. how would you have us address that? Yeah, so, and I've wrestled with this in coming here. I was sort of like, oh, what am I going to do? Am I going to even bring it up? And I'm just like, I can't. It's not, I, it's the elephant in the room that I just can't not bring up. Uh, and, and my gut response is, I, is to say, I don't quite know. Um, but I think, I think starting to figure out how it is that you can even broach the opportunity to talk about it is putting you into at least a realm where you're saying, we just want to kind of recognize the sort of writing on the wall that some of our students around here also happen to come from this particular faith tradition, and some don't, or some maybe do, and they're no longer really interested in that, and maybe this is part of their journey in not going to BYU. They chose USU because they felt that they could come here and explore what that meant in their own development, and we want to be receptive to both sides of that. And I, and I get it. There are, there, there's, uh, I think there's just a different overtone, especially because you're you're more rural than in Salt Lake, for example. And so it's a little different where it's like, well, I grew up going to church with this person. They know my mom and dad. Or I think there's some of that stuff that's going to um, always kind of be part of that overtone. But I think you do a lot in telling your students that, like, we're really interested in understanding the meaning-making aspects of our students from all the manner of faith and non-faith traditions, recognizing that a lot of our students come from a common faith background. So that does form who a lot of your students are because it's foundational to who we are as human beings is to be spiritual. Like that's what that literature tells us is that in, in, in and of ourselves just having uh, spirit in our bodies, that in and of itself is spiritual. How long has humanity been trying to look to the heavens to figure out where we came from? That is the common denominator in the human experience across all of history as we can interpret it all the way back to cave drawings. We can't deny that in the 21st century. So that's where I think you starting to even call it out to say this is a challenge for us, this is how it expresses itself, and we want to do better by that, both in recognizing the importance of that for some people in particular faith traditions as they identify, or the receptivity of being open to all because we're publicly funded, because we're a public university. Uh, and so there's an interesting tension here that I think doesn't necessarily exist at a lot of other institutions. Um, so I, I, I can't. Uh, this, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, I didn't mean to cut you off. I wanted to hear your last sentence. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I don't have a firm statement to say this is what I think you should do. But I think in that sense of like calling it what it is and starting there is at least a starting place to invite people into the conversation around what does that mean then for USU to form its own identity around student meaning making and the meaning making expressions of faculty and staff in the context in which you find yourself, which is a largely uh, uh, LDS or, or Mormon affiliated population. And that's just part of your reality. Yeah. Who you are. I, I just wanted to say not only do I agree, but as somebody who's worked in Utah higher ed for a number of years now, like so many of us in the room, I think one of the interesting pieces is that this kind of homogeneity actually affords us an opportunity to think about not just student development and identity development in terms of religiosity or spirituality, but also in terms of all kinds of other identities. When your population is 80% or something close to that um, white uh, and, and LDS and a number of other demographic factors, I think what we have to be really open to is the idea that students may or may not find there in terms of that meaning making there's going to be something that they 
they prioritize in that that we may not anticipate and certainly that we may not visibly see immediately. And so we really have to be conscious about the fact that any student who comes to us may be a student who's going to identify themselves as other in the context of that homogeneity for some reason or, or whatever. Um, and it's not going to always be a, a person of color or a student who's first generation or uh, low income or something along these lines. Do you see where I'm going? I mean, we need to protect and, and be conscious of the experience of our students who are, are immediately and self-identifying as different from the outset. But we also have to be aware that these these are students in transitional spaces, regardless of age, um, I would also argue. And so this kind of a discussion opens us up, not just to the spirituality, the concept of faith transition or any of these other things, but all of the ways in which student identity is in transition. Yeah, that's a great point. I really appreciate that a lot. When I think about the kinds of uh, recommendations that I've made, for example, to faculty is really just saying, like, how could you even incorporate the notion of meaning making into some sort of a disciplinary aspect of your class. So how do you even tell your students, like, I'm really interested in you reflecting on your own sense of meaning making in this world in light of this biology thing that we're studying or this literature thing that we're studying. And so even just taking that posture of saying that, that this is a safe place to bring that into the academic conversation, um, that we can actually wrestle with that, that academics do that. We do that in the academy and we create that safe environment. Um, part of it is also, starting to figure out what is the language that you want to start to collectively begin to curate that tells your students that being part of the other matters here. Again, talk back to that Harkin idea of membership. And so if you are coming here and you already know perhaps that you're a part of an other in regard to a faith community more broadly, what is the collective language that the university needs to start to think about using that says you matter here just as much as the person next to you who looks like they were a shoe in to come here because they grew up in town and they did like, what, what does that actually look like and how do you develop that language? Uh, in my uh, article in About Campus, I talk about that in particular with faculty development and bringing into these conversations of meaning making in particular with students of color, in particular then for students that, that, that you don't necessarily have a natural connection to. So if, for me, it's like thinking about what is it that I need to know that's going to be able to help an African American young man who I'm advising as a faculty member know that his meaning making experience is important for me that he bring that into his collective learning in both my classroom environments and in the environments we create outside of classrooms together. And so starting to just even think about that developmentally. What does that look like, sound like, how can you curate that? Uh, and I think that there's some ripple impacts maybe in things like student leadership and, and how do we call that out from one another in the context of community. At the end of the day, when we think about our structural model of thriving, it sort of forms this way when we think about this. So when we're doing structural proofs, statistically, we're looking at the extent to which we can explain the variation in what we call the ultimate endogenous variable, which is a really fancy term for saying this guy right here over on the thriving side. Uh, ultimately, that's what we're trying to explain. In this case, we're understanding uh, variation in thriving of students. And the variables that you see, the different constructs that we've talked about, on the left-hand side of thriving, those are the items that help us understand that variation in student thriving. Uh, and so you can geek out with me and read my silly paper on SEM that's on our website if you want to see all the statistical proofs of that. Uh, Mitchell and I have had some great conversation around that because he's like, this is, this is great. Um, there's not a lot of us that do that work because it's really kind of weird. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's an important when we're thinking about uh, trying to actually make concrete uh, uh, assumptions around what it is that we're measuring and what it actually un helps us understand and doesn't help us understand. And what we're saying here is statistically we've gone through some really fancy techniques to say we know there's this thing called thriving. We know we can measure it and we know that there's other things that are happening in the lives of students that help us understand how it varies for them. And that the pathways between these different components are either significant in their understanding or are not significant in their understanding. And in my work what I found is that there's actually not this like universal pathways to thriving, but for the different students of color groups, actually the pathways matter. So there's different pathways that offer us different opportunities. That's where that idea of meaning making, in particular for non-dominant culture students, I find that that was highly statistically significant at a rate that was different than majority culture students. 
And I say, we don't think about meaning making and student success usually in the same conversation. And I think we need to. Because I think what we've shown time and time again is that it can help us understand that. So before we do some, a quick break, and then I want to do some breakouts. So before we do that, um, I want to talk about this idea of fostering thriving. Because I think there's some opportunities on campus when you think about the different groups on campus who have different touch points with students in different venues, different avenues, um, that there's some real key opportunities here. Um, so uh, in thinking about this, I think there's avenues through community, I think there's avenues through optimism, and again, avenues through spirituality or meaning making. Uh, and I think that all of those can exist through different potential verticals within the organization. Uh, and so I want to talk about that. I use this term kind of incubators. So this, pardon me, this idea of like, if we have peer interaction already happening on campus, how can that peer interaction leverage aspects of community? How could that peer interaction leverage optimism? So do you have mental health challenges on this campus with students? All right. Are you doing any group therapy opportunities yet? It's kind, it's kind of new. I know some campuses are doing it, some, some aren't. So I was at UCLA fairly recently giving a talk on thriving, and the associate chancellor sort of said, they're talking about it in the sense of uh, student resiliency in higher education. Uh, and, and then interestingly enough, apparently I'm not too boring because they invited me to come back and talk to the College of California psychologists next month on student resiliency and thriving. Uh, but what I've said to them is, how about, what about this idea of optimism? I'm going to go click forward to that slide. I'm going to come back to this one. Marty Seligman talks about this as the pathways to optimism. So he talks about this idea of learned optimism, developing an optimistic explanatory style, he calls it. And I think about this as a key mental health initiative on campus. And I think that if you could figure out ways to bake this into different aspects of student culture, whether it's specifically led through your counseling uh, type of department or student services department looking at mental health initiatives. I think this is opportune to think about ways student government could learn uh, about uh, the different optimistic explanatory style things. How do you help your students just be optimistic about the future? Okay, UCLA has almost doubled down the visits since Trump got elected to their counseling center. That is shocking and how do they even meet the need because before that they couldn't meet the need and all of a sudden the election happened and they're like we have this influx of students who think the sky is falling. And all we're trying to say to them is like, put your foot in front of the other and go to class on Tuesday. Like, and that's where they got to start because they just can't serve the needs of all the students in that basic manner. And there was this discombobulating life event for many of their students and all of a sudden it doubled their intake at the psychology center. So we need to help our students understand that the sun was going to come up tomorrow. We fundamentally believe that. That they can pass this class. That they can graduate here. That everything is not just hum and glum, and at the same token, there are students who are off the mental health spectrum who do need clinical services, but I would argue that there's a lot of vast majority of our students who just are experiencing the tough parts of life. And they don't necessarily need one-to-one -one counseling to solve all those problems, and I think we can help them demonstrate how community and the human experience can together get us through the things that are difficult, that are hard to understand, or that sometimes derail the way we see the world. And I'm not discounting that students who are experiencing mental, well, uh, uh, lack of mental wellness. Those folks, they need help. They might need medication. They might need combinations of medication and good therapy. And they can be successful students too. But this is another way to think about optimism as a gateway towards thriving. And I think that there's a lot of different verticals that we potentially miss where we're not asking our students to be DSM-4 certified and understand whether or not they can clinically diagnose Depression. We're just saying, can you help develop optimism in your peers? And how might that look and sound and feel? This idea of fostering the four elements of a psychological sense of community, we talked pretty in depth about that because I think that that's a real promising space to think about helping students thrive. Is to first get them to experience that psychological sense of community, really foster that, safeguard that, build that, and on top of that, have all these other touch points with meaning making experiences and things like learned optimism as real pathways to understanding how students can thrive. And then lastly, there's this idea of meaning making. I throw this up there again, it's a bit of an eye chart. This comes out of a newsletter from 2009, um, so it's volume five, issue three, 2009. This is the College Student Beliefs and Values folks, um, spirituality and higher education. Uh, so this is Henri Nouwen's um, conceptualization of spirituality in the human experience, um, which I think is kind of really fascinating. Um, but to think about how we we're calling students into these conversations, it's sort of like, uh, it's this, you, see, you see this This is iterative, so this would go back into spiritual formation and identity formation. 
uh, theories to be able to say that like you haven't necessarily arrived to a particular level when it comes to your spiritual enlightenment. We're continually asking these questions inward, upward, outward, and upward. Who am I? How do I make a difference? And is there something more? And I'm going to make the argument here, people, that this is a part of the human experience. That this is not anchored in a religion. That this is a part of what it means to be human is to ask these kinds of core questions. And you'll find that that uh, people who would identify as, as human secularists or atheists, they still do this. And they lean into, who am I? I am a human in this world today. Well, you know, how do I make a difference? I do that with the outward aspects of my actions. And is there something more? Yeah, I can invest in the next generation. That's what my atheistic friends who are, who are human secularists, who are faculty members, that's what they say. That's why they're in education. Um, otherwise, at the end of the day, they would probably choose a different career anyway. So I, I'm going to make the, the firm argument here that I can sit down with my friends who are devout in every other religion and not devout in any religion at all and still say we're spiritual people and these are the kinds of questions we're asking. Our students are asking the same questions. And we can draw them into an experience that takes them toward a path of thriving as a human being and as a student here and we help them understand the world around them by asking, helping them ask some of these questions. Questions about these three different possibilities. This is what I want you to dissect after we take a break. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing students with that optimism, optimism that have different suitcases. So this one comes and they have the optimism and they have the suitcase full of these tools mm -hmm. that person has optimism, but their suitcase may be a little empty of those tools. Yep. They still have the optimism, but they didn't have the tools. Yeah. So some levels of optimism is part of the question there. Um, what I kind of go back to is some of that hope theory then too in the application of the academic domain. So if I'm, if I have some of the tools of optimism, how can I continue to refine them? But then at the end of the day, am I beginning to express them in my academic journey? So do I have a sense of willpower or way power? And so when we're trying to think about what, what students are bringing into that equation, it's like, which parts of that are they potentially lacking? We can measure it here in our instrument and say, you know, categorically this student has lower academic determination than her peer. Um, you can just think about it conceptually and ask the kinds of questions you're asking that student. Like, so do you know, like, how you're going to perceive your next term? And that, that somewhat optimistic student is kind of like, well, maybe, and then maybe I've got the willpower because I really want to get it done because I'm first gen and by God gun and I'm going to be the first person in my family to get a college degree. Or they're going to be like, no, and I'm stupid and I, a total failure. And you're like, okay, so we're starting at a different place. Um, and so in that sense, it's trying to be really sensitive to who they are. It starts off with creating a safe space where they can even articulate that and where you have relationships to ask the question. Um, but at the end of the day, it's trying to think about what are you bringing so to your question of like these, these mixed suitcases. I like that. I like that image of the students kind of coming to class with suitcases. One's half full, one's part full. Um, I think part of that then is in creating that environment, we can even talk about that, have a little vulnerability to say like, you know, tomorrow's kind of unclear to me. So I don't know. And my peer being like, oh, don't worry about tomorrow, man. We got that covered. It's like, okay, how can I maybe create an environment where we actually talk about that? I refine that through that experience, we create that safe space, and we take that next step together. That's going to be different based on your role. If you're a peer versus perhaps a faculty member in one-to-one -one with that student, doing that through academic advising, is this an opportunity for you to start to think about what that looks like? Perhaps this student needs a pathway plan that's a little more specific than that student before because their levels of optimism are just going to carry that other student through. They're like, I'll see you next term and we'll figure out the next term thereafter. Or that other student who says, I really feel like I need to better understand what's next. And trying to really listen to those cues and figure out what does that mean? Does that student have that sense of optimism that's taking him or her forward? Or is that something that we need to start to work on and go back to some of the work that, that Seligman offers us in saying, which, which aspect of the ABCDEs are they uh, at when it comes to way Seligman's looking at optimism. Do we need to intervene with them uh, at just the belief level because they've experienced the adversity and they just don't even believe that there's a pathway forward. And that's essentially that's essentially what uh, what uh, Seligman's optimism model is telling us. Other questions before we take a quick break? Yeah. Back to the faculty student interaction. I'm just a little unclear on what exactly to do. Is there a way to an example of how to talk to students. <laughs> how to talk to students, yeah. So, um, so when I, when, okay, so when I think about this, and, and part of my challenge is that when I teach, I teach grad students. So it's, it's, I know it's vastly different than those who are teaching undergrads on a regular basis. Um, so I think about the posture of ways that we invite students into 
environments with us. I'll use a quick example from a colleague at the office. So I have, we have a colleague at our office who is finishing up her PhD at the University of Texas. Her daughter is down at one of the state serving institutions south of town. And her daughter called up and said to her mom, so I'm meeting with this faculty member tomorrow. And he called me and said that he wants to meet me at the coffee shop. Should I be worried? And so our colleague, who kind of laughed, this is her daughter, well, it means one of two things. Uh, either he wants coffee, uh, or he wants to demonstrate to you that he's human and meet you in a non-threatening place other than his office. Um, so for example, like what are the environments we're creating for students to interact with outside a classroom as faculty? We know that that's a really important aspect of the learning experience, that there's important aspects of what's happening in a classroom, and there's really important aspects that are happening outside a classroom. But we know also from our literature and from the research we've been doing on our work in thriving is that Students who are less primed to thrive and tend to be of cultures that haven't perhaps experienced higher education, first gen type students, for example, they don't really know what an office hour is supposed to do. And in many cases, they see that as a huge threat and concern. Like, if I go to the office hour, I'm stupid. I am admitting that I'm dumb and therefore going to talk to the faculty member, so I will not do that. Versus that student whose parents went through higher ed and they're like, well, did you go to their office hour and ask them what's going to be on the exam? Like, um, and then, you know, that, that student would be like, oh, right. So like this colleague of mine, she says, no, you go and you meet with him over coffee and you enjoy that coffee and then you figure out how you take that next step. And I was like, okay. So she went and she met with him and it was great. And she's like, well, we just sat over coffee. He was really nice. And our colleague's like, yes, that's exactly what he was trying to do. Are we telling our students that? And are we inviting them into those safe spaces to interact with us? So are we doing that outside of classroom, right outside class, literally? Um, when we create office hours, are we very explicitly telling them what we do? hours and why coming is important. Why would it matter? Um, and then when we're there, what are we doing? So how are we leveraging that time to then really lean into the things that are going to take them to that next level as a student in relationship to all these different kind of concepts that we're talking about? So Darnell Cole would say, for our students who are struggling, don't just focus on the things that they need to do better on, because that's where they're going to hear you. That's all they're going to hear. Instead, they need reinforcement mechanisms, positive reinforcement mechanisms to say, yes, it's difficult. You can do this. I'm here to help you. This is, you know, this is this is this is what success can look like for you, you know. And then really leaning into that, building that cadre of trust, so that they look at it and they're not just walking back into your classroom and being like, "Well, last week we talked, so she knows that I'm already worried about the exam, and I'm going to go in there and fail it." And so they then fulfill their own destiny. But I don't know if that helps a little bit, but in this idea of just like telling them what what do we expect? How do we create that safe space? Perhaps even saying to students, for example, come in groups of three to my office hours. Please, like, I expect you all to come within the first five weeks to know where my office is, to know that I don't bite, uh, and that I can put a pot of tea on and I will offer it to you as a nice host. Like, you know, and we can just humanize our own experience. Again, when we don't do that as faculty, some of our students think of us as like a teaching and researching machines. You know, it's like when you run into your, your elementary school teacher in the, in the grocery store as a kid, you're like, oh, you don't live at the school? You know, and, and so the, our, our university students need to do that too. Like they need to realize that we have real lives. Uh, and so if you're a department administrator and you could facilitate something like a progressive dessert night amongst your faculty for your students, what a way to humanize your faculty. Really to tell your students like, hey, I'm just having an open house and I'm going to have cheesecake bites and I live over on 4th. I just walk over anytime between 6 and 10 that night. You can meet my family and pet my dog uh, and, uh, and just get to know me. I think there's, there's that aspect of just humanizing this and Telling our students we're human too, and we're we'll trying to figure this all out together. Other questions? So I want to take a break, and then what I'd love you to do for you to do, I'd love you to do, I'd love for you to do, uh, is to then think a little bit, just reflect on some of the stuff that we that I've talked about, and then find a colleague or two, or whether you're in the same department or not, and try to think about how could this inform the work you do today, and what might you do a little differently starting tomorrow. Whether that's like, what is your kind of key next question for your team? If you're in an authority position to be able to just make a decision of change, what might that be that one thing that you change starting tomorrow based on what you've learned today? We'll do some of that kind of think, pair, and share, and then we'll, we'll call everybody back together to share about some of those different things that in your world you say, this really resonated with me. I want to read more about this. This is the question I want to ask. This is what I'm going to do a little differently starting tomorrow. Based on what we've talked about. Take... 3.02, take a good 10, 15 minutes, let's come back together and, and pair and share, and by 3.40, hopefully, we'll do, do some more group sharing. I'd love to hear what you're kind of, what's 
Okay, so we'll call folks back together. Um, the computer restarted on me, so uh, Mitchell's getting that loaded up, mostly so you can see uh, the website to where our thriving information is. But I'd love to, to hit up with some folks that are at a distance uh, and get a sense if there's uh, something that you want to share with us about your conversation um, at some of the, the distance sites. So this is Mike from TWILA. I'm the current Vice President for the Student Association for the TWILA campus, and I will be the incoming Regional Campus President next year for the Student Association. And we were discussing how what you've presented so far affects student government and what we do, and the trainings we have planned for the spring and the fall for the Regional Campus students, because we're not traditional students. We have, for the most part, a different perspective than the traditional students on the Logan campus. So I'm, we're looking at how what you presented will can be adapted to what we need to be trained on. Yeah, and there's, there's opportunities when we think about, well, when we talk about psychological sense of community on campus, uh, I would make the argument that then for your students in your environment, that, that it's really a matter of trying to figure out how do you build and safeguard a psychological sense of community for those students. Uh, in the groups in which they interact with their peers and in the modalities that they interact together. Um, and so, yeah, so there's some really interesting opportunities there. And that was highlighted for me last, or two weeks ago, when I was doing my campaigning for the new position. I went to different campuses and saw the different environments. For example, Twila and Brigham City have a completely different environment than the Salt Lake campus has. Different student populations, the way they interact with each other. It was really interesting to see how Brigham City and Salt Lake, they're sitting in groups studying, or sorry, Brigham City and Twila, we have groups studying, lots of interaction with the students, where in Salt Lake it was get from the elevator to your classroom as fast as possible, and then get from the classroom to the elevator as fast as possible when it's over. Anybody else who's uh, at a distance from us today? I got voted to talk for Vernal, I guess. Um, we were kind of intrigued at how, if optimism is that important in the outcomes, then we should probably figure out a way to promote optimism or measure optimism when students begin, and how do we do that? And we talked about various ways that we thought we might do that, and human connection was one of them, um, having um, the advisors the interactions that they have with people. I think our student services here in, in uh, Vernal are very friendly when people come up to the, the desk. I think they feel welcomed, and that's kind of important. But anyway, optimism, you know, we thought it said adversity, so we thought we could create adversity situations for them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyway, that was kind of a big question. You know, how do you really promote that? Um, and we ex challenge it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's great. Like, so I mean, one opportunity would be so our positive perspective measure is essentially a function of optimism. So optimism is within that, that factor of thriving, uh, and so that could be a starting place even there is just to measure positive perspective. Um, and when, I, when we present this idea of uh, of optimism, in particular Seligman's work on learned optimism. Uh, it's just our continuing to lean back on that work that we've done where we've said, you know, end of term thriving is so linked to incoming levels of positive perspective. And Seligman says that optimism is something we can develop over time. So how is it that we could anchor that? So I, I've been saying to folks even like mental well, wellness initiatives that are rooted in optimism and to, to try to do that and operationalize that over time for people so that the times that they experience different elements on campus, that, they're, that they have passive programs around optimism. So everything from some signage on bulletin boards and emails to everything that's like active and what does it really mean to be entering into a place where we're helping them develop that sense of an optimistic explanatory style. Uh, is, uh, I have no idea where um, this is Trish and Vernon. I have a question and we kind of discussed this but we wondered if we could help prepare students more coming in if that would raise their optimism if they felt more prepared, prepared and ready. Is that a factor, or do you think that's completely a different thing? 
No, I, I, think, I think you're on a, an interesting track there. I've, I've always wondered about um, the different roles that, say, it, enrollment and admissions could play in that in priming sort of optimistic uh, opportunities for students. Um, what would that look like? What would that sound like if we really took a, a look at the different pathways that we interact with students through that pre-matriculation process? Uh, and what would it look like then if we actually oriented those around optimism or, or, or training toward optimism? Because um, that's initially your real first, first blush touch point with students uh, outside of, say, going back to your K-12 to uh, partners in your regions where you, where you recruit the most from and saying, hey, we really want to try to see what a grade 11 and 12 uh, optimism intervention could look like. I, I'm super fascinated and would love to read that study. Um, and I think that there's opportunity there to think about it in high school or uh, you know, amongst adult learners who are coming back to say, as you're thinking about university, again, their touch point typically then becomes them exploring and saying, I'm interested in a degree program. So thereafter, what is it we could be sending them that says, um, this is what we think is important for you in your learning and thinking about being optimistic about your future. I'm, I'm, I'm curious too, and I think that there's, there's some real uh, potential opportunity there. Yes, sir. Here, here's an extremely self-promoting self idea. Um, we have gear up schools across the country, or across the state. Uh, USU participates and other institutions in the state do. If you can get your middle school and high school students who are in your areas involved with those programs, it's, it's a lot of that program is showing people that higher education is, is a place for them, where mm -hmm. otherwise they're not getting that modeled. Totally. So great, great programs, and we run them out of, out of our campus. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. In the room here, uh, folks that want to tell us a little bit about what you talked about in your smaller group, what were some of the questions you asked? What might be a next step something that you're going to maybe do differently uh, in light of some of the things you've been learning today? Yeah. Trying to teach in connections, um, which I think is really a great place if we can continue to advise students to go and take connections um, because we're having them ask those big questions, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? Um, those type of things that I think are kind of tie into the, you know, meaning of um, and the spirituality type questions. So I think that was really great, thinking about that. Um, and then also, I, I thought it also helped with, I know you talked about membership, too. And I feel like Connections also helps with that whole membership. You know, they were part of the common reading literature. They get a game t-shirt that they can wear to their first game. And, and all of those things, I think, really help. Um, so the more we can do with Connections and, and here on campus and getting students into there, I think the better they're going to be with that first semester. But I would love um, to get my students to be optimistic. It's interesting because I've done some research on positive psychology as well. And for me, um, I actually do a, a special little lecture with my, my students in Connections and teach them about positive psychology and some things that they can do for that. And I always felt like it was really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now you have research to back up, hey, this really is important. And it's probably a good thing that I include that in my, in my presentations as well. Absolutely. So. I'm glad, I'm glad to be backed up with that too, so anyways. But one question I had was about your adversity um, model that you had. Um, what, it, are those supposed to be considered as steps? So you, like if they get, once they get adversity, then they get belief? Uh, so, yeah, so the way, that, the way that Seligman talks about that, <clears throat> I'll go back to that slide then. Um, so he basically says that this is the process through which people should go through uh, yeah, and, and when optimistic uh, explanatory styles exist or are in play for individuals that they go through these steps in a like, positive manner in which they then experience an adversity, then they have their belief through that adversity, so they have something that is a trigger because of that challenge, uh, that, that then they, they can best understand or experience the consequences that are related to the adversity, uh, that they can then dispute the, the negative aspects of it, that they actually can articulate that, that they can then say, you know, this, this was the challenge, this is what I believe about that challenge, um, this is what I know to be the consequence of that, but I know that that's not permanent, so I have this like way of actually thinking about that, and I'm actually energized towards something else. So he basically says that that's sort of the way that, that op like optimism takes a loop all the way through a challenge for people who then have that positive outlook on things, that optimistic explanatory style, 
helps them to go through that systematically to say, what is this challenge that I'm facing? What do I believe about it? What is the consequence of that? How do I dispute that? And then what am I energized toward to make something different on my path? And that's essentially the steps he, he basically says go through. So he's got a, a pop-ed book that's out. Um, I think it's called Learned Optimism. It's like, it's like Penguin Text or something like that. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to read. Uh, and then he's also got some stuff in the Oxford Manual of Positive Psych. It's a little bit deeper dive on what this means for the outcome. So one of the things we've done, to your point on the discussions around positive psych in a class, we did some, um, uh, two years ago, we did uh, an A-B test on mindfulness uh, as a tool toward thriving. Uh, and we found that it didn't impact thriving insofar as that experiment. But it was a one-time mindfulness exercise. So that keeps us going back to this sense that like, we need to reinforce these things. Psychologically, these constructs, they're amenable to change, but they are also markedly stable. So trying to also figure out who else in that world and that connections point for that student across whatever that, is that in their first year? Yeah, first it's term? just like a first week and first then some follow-up classes. Yeah, so how does that follow up? What are, what are some of the ways that students could experience that curricularly across that first term, whether there's ways to get faculty buy-in around a common question. So you just say, can you animate this question on a regular basis? We're really just trying to, to help the students develop this thing. I was at UCLA, they use a common book, uh, and they do the common book that they choose every year, and then they anchor that both across faculty, staff, and students, and then they, they ask faculty to say, is there a way you can try to integrate this into your curriculum in the first year? And they're using that as sort of the gateway to have these positive conversations around things like learned optimism in particular. And they're seeing that as like, they're like, we already have that apparatus in place. So how can we choose the, the text and prime the questions, because we send out primer questions um, that then are, are helping people deliberate in certain you know, prompted ways throughout the course of the term over time. Yeah. Conversations about learned optimism. I think it's interesting how you can use a similar word to explain similar phenomena mm -hmm. because resiliency is another one of the big words mm -hmm. yep. and, and our office has really tried to hit on that aspect we created a workshop a grit workshop that discusses mm -hmm. growth resiliency initiative tenacity and grit mm -hmm. to try to teach them that everyone fails yep. that's normal yep. but what matters is how you bounce back yeah. And so I think it's interesting that this thriving, it's all different words, but I think the ultimate purpose is very similar for yeah. what we've been driving at. And so I think it, for me, this has been interesting to see like, oh yeah, we're doing that, just we don't call it that. <laughs> so Some of that is creating those common threads then across that student experience so that students kind of keep having those touch points. Again, like I keep coming back to saying, oh, it's important that we then see the stability of our own dysfunction. <laughs> Uh, if we're if we're not quite thriving, we continue to not quite thrive until we over time really change that. Uh, so I was at, out at Duke. Duke uh, the Duke Foundation hosted um, a resil student resiliency symposium this summer, and I was invited to speak. So I talked about our measurement of thriving because there's a lot of institutions that were gathered there, specifically a lot of them talking and using resiliency as a term and saying, you know, we, we believe in this idea of student resiliency. What next? And so they were actually really fascinated. They're like, you are, you're further along in the measurement journey of this than any of us were conceptualizing it. We're not measuring it. One of the cool things that I saw there, one of the, I, I thought actually the coolest thing, um, was what was happening at Stanford. And so they were having this like um, Stanford fail moments or whatever. I can't remember exactly what they called it, but it was, they were basically took all these little vignette clips and they captured for students at Stanford, tell us about an epic failure as a student here at Stanford. And they were trying to normalize failure. And it was sort of this everyone fails and not everybody has to suck because of it. So you can fail and you can still proceed. So as students were saying, I am in my third year of law and I failed my first law class. <laughs> and I am still here. And, they, and so, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but then they had like a hashtag sign and the people held the hashtag sign, told their little story and then talked about failure. And they did this over the course of a number of weeks with these vignette videos. They embedded them on Facebook, showed them on had posters on like the sides of school uh, bus stops around campus. And then they, they had this epic uh, uh, kind of wrap-up night where a whole bunch of people got up there and did these like one-off kind of artistic expressions of their own failure. And they had this really creative way of expressing that. And on a campus like Stanford where they said, you know, it's this hidden phenomenon in Stanford. Every student struggles at Stanford and they don't think that anyone else does because they haven't created a culture that's safe enough to say, I totally screwed up on that test. 
or I wasn't as prepared as I could have been and now I know it. And, and, and in not being able to even be open about it, how do you build resilience if you think you're the only one? So that was super fascinating to me. Um, Tried to show them a video of famous failures, right? Like Michael Jackson got cut from the high school basketball team. <laughs> Michael, Jordan. <laughs> Michael, Jordan. Michael, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. <laughs> 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 it's okay. And, they, um, and, and different things like that. And then we also have them look back at their past obstacles and how they overcame them, looking back from the past, saying, you can do this, and you can do it now. And so that's one of the strategies we started using. And not so much thriving, but I think it's gradually pretty much along with a lot of the things of this growth mindset that you can change and overcome, you can learn how to be optimistic yep. or be resilient. Yeah. So you talked about a couple different aspects in there too that I think are important to call out. So there's uh, Duckworth's grit scale. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you actually use. That's, that's, yeah, at Civitas we actually have a partner that's collecting that and it actually enters into their data model with this Civitas, which is fascinating. Um, you talked about the mindset inventory uh, and so Carol Dweck's work on mindset is really pivotal. We have a couple of the mindset items actually are in the Thriving Quotient um, that we use and we, and we look at, at mindset as kind of that understanding. The other side of that, we have some folks uh, who, uh, so my colleague Laurie Schreiner wrote, uh, co-wrote the uh, Strengths Quest book. So if, you're, if you understand the Gallup Strengths language, uh, so the Strengths Quest was written for college students. Uh, she and Chip Anderson uh, and Don Clifton uh, co-wrote that together. Don Clifton sort of being the sort of one of the godfathers of positive psychology. and He was president of Gallup for a number of years uh, before he passed away. And so they're uh, looking at the idea of then leveraging talent development. So that sort of idea of strengths being an identification of a core talent theme uh, and the strength itself being the talent plus the strength and a skill and knowledge that's applied to that talent is the expression of the strength. Helping students using strength-based or talent-based reflective exercises uh, to say, what in your past, what was the strength that you leaned on in the past to be successful, and how might you apply that to a future challenge? Uh, so Strength Quest is a great tool to be able to use. It's, it's, it's for purchase, and so other folks are using Seligman's VIA Character Strengths tool, but that's free. That's on his site, it's just, he's at 10. Uh, so VIA Character Strengths are another one you can utilize. It's a free inventory tool to see. Thank you. Anyone else? Thursday afternoon of spring break, and everyone's like, he told us we could do this early. Some realization that I've come, so as we work with Civitas, and we built the system out, and we spent a lot of time looking at learning analytics and what they can do and what they offer, so often in higher education, and partly because this is the way that the data has been presented in higher education, we've so often looked at descriptive data as the way that we respond to students. So if our average student is having this kind of experience, we should come up with a universal program to address all students, even though the descriptives are only about the average student. Mm -hmm. And so this book, End of Average, right, where if something that's designed off of everyone just tends to be relevant to no one, mm -hmm. it's very hard to universalize interventions. And I think that the thing that the thriving um, model really stands out to me is this idea that that it almost demands that there's a there's individual interaction with students. It almost demands that the the awareness of the university about what the student needs happens on a much smaller level. And we're not finding out what the average student needs at USU, but what this particular student needs. And as far as that's concerned, it reminds me of something we were talking about this term in terms of a medical model of this idea that um, we admit all students, and just like, you know, they all come with different baggage, it's almost like we admit them into the hospital all with different diseases, chronic illnesses, that are gonna manifest themselves different in their academic career. Some of them have anemia, and some of them have jaundice, and some of them have... Everybody gets an aspirin. Yeah, right. But what, it's, it's worse than aspirin, it's everyone gets vitamins. Like, mm. there's this feel-good, like, We'll just give everyone vitamins, regardless of their chronic illness, and regardless of what specific treatment would be recommended based on the prognosis, vitamins are good for everyone. So let's just give everyone vitamins. And of course, the, the fail in the logic is, is this, no, if we're admitting students with a chronic condition like anemia, or in this case, academic anemia, 
there's going to be a very specific treatment that that student needs in order to overcome that and ultimately succeed and not die. And, and as a university, we're so good at handing everyone a pack of the standard, like the daily multivitamin, and say, if you just do the daily multivitamin at USU, average. You'll, you'll, you'll be great. But, but what, what Thriving really emphasizes is that we actually can hone in on what those students' issues are. There was those five circles. They may be just struggling on one, not on five, or some combination of three, or whatever it is. And based on what they're struggling on, the intervention looks very unique and very different to that circumstance. Yeah, and timeliness then matters. And so where I would challenge you on that. So you were saying how it's got to be individual or one-to-one-ish. Uh, uh, -one and I would say this needs to be personalized. Some of that means it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, I, I wrote a blog fairly recently on the Civitas Learning Space. If you go to civitaslearningspaces.com, you'll see uh, my blog posts on there. And one of them, I talk about this idea of using wide brushes to paint student success and how the wide brush it saves some. It's not, like, it's a do no harm kind of model. It's your vitamin metaphor, right? So, like, the vitamins aren't going to hurt you. But if you need insulin, you're still going to die. Like, you might take vitamins and, like, they're like, well, he died. His vitamin K levels were just bang on, but he died. Uh, and so, when I talk about is this idea of then being able to personalize the way we paint the student success initiatives for individual students or for groups of students. And that's where. I've been trying to advocate for this idea of a group model to intervene on students, both from a mental health perspective. So we're thinking about mental wellness like initiatives. I go to UCLA, and I mean, literally, their, their associate chancellor brought me in with eyes this big, just saying, like, you need to help us figure out what we're going to do around student resilience because we cannot provide the clinical model for every student. And I said, yeah, I know that's insane. You're, you, you can't be a clinical provider in Southern California. Like, that's not your mandate. Your mandate is to be an educational provider. But are there group options to think about student resilience where you are naturally trying to catch the students in those areas that need that particular intervention and design the intervention in a catered way that is specific to their needs and timely. And some of those students, another, another one of my blogs, I talk about this idea of student success as a scaffold metaphor. I think of your students as a structure. And when you go to restore a structure, at times, you'll deploy scaffolding. And at times, if you, you know, if you've recently been to Europe, this is basically all you see is scaffolding completely enveloping an entire building. Uh, and now they're actually nice enough to print an image of the building on there so that when you stand in the piazza and you're like, oh, that's what it looks like behind that. Um, but um, there's reasons why they deploy scaffolding all the way up the building, right? Because that building needs an overhaul. And there's times when we have students who we're working with and they need an academic overhaul. They need lots of scaffolding and they need it for a long time. There's other buildings where if you just need to get up to the second floor to just redo the windowsills, you put out a stage of scaffold, you redo the windowsills, you take the staging down when you're done. And I like that metaphor when we think about student success initiatives because there's times when students come in uh, through their, their, their journey in, uh, in university where they need lots of scaffolding and they need it for a while and others where they just need it up and it's timely and the dosage is correct and we take it back down. So we don't need to just have, have our students like walking around with all the scaffolding all the way through their university trajectory. That would be kind of antithetical to what we were trying to do, I think, in the academic community. Um, but when we can understand where they're at risk, when we can understand why they need a particular support mechanism, I would like to think that, they're, that our ability to provide them opportunities to fall into those support mechanisms as opposed to falling away from campus by, by leaving, uh, I'd like to think that, that our propensity to provide those things uh, is going to be better and more timely, and we can understand that in a nuanced way. Anyone else here with kind of some last thoughts? I just have one thought to go along with that kind of string of comment and conversation that we just had. Um, there are times when we just have to get to the whole group of students and we have to get to them quickly. But what I have noticed is when the, I take the time to make my email to that mass group fill individual to the particular student that's reading, then I get a lot of success out of it. For instance, I invited some students to apply for a student government position, and I just gave them all the nuts and bolts and information that they needed to have. But I started the email with something personable. It was like spring break. Hope your spring break's going well. Haven't talked to you for a bit. But if you need to come in and chat with me, make sure you come in after the break. And then I gave them all the information about the position. And I had gobs and gobs and gobs of students respond back saying, 
thank you for considering me and thinking that I'm up to snuff to be in this student position. I'll think about doing student government for a future term. I really appreciate that you would think of me for this. And in reality, I just took my math mailing list and personalized the email and made sure I sent it to the individual student's name and gave enough flavor in that email that I was hitting them individually and concerned about their welfare in that time period that I got a better response. That's great. And um, for those of you who will be using the Inspire for Advisor tool that will be coming uh, to campus, that's going to be a tool that's going to be able to allow you to do that. At Civitas, that's what we've been providing for our partners, is a different, uh, different databases of kind of uh, short form message. Um, they tend to be emailing them. Some of our partners are using SMS technology. But to your point, um, you know, we, we, we look at it and we say, you know, how can you be positive? How can you be personal? How can you be short? Uh, and if you can capture that student's attention if they're reading their email, um, then how, how is it that they receive that in a way that they go, oh, that was unique to me? Um, and so that's what's kind of a cool bridge between the work that, that I've been doing my research on thriving and the work we do at Civitas where I'm like, I get this opportunity to develop these mindset messages alongside our, our partners. A lot of them are just positive psych based. So we'll say, well, this is an academic self-efficacy kind of motivated uh, message. This one over here is around environmental mastery. And this one over here is, is growth mindset. And this one over here is, is grit and resiliency. Uh, and so really thinking about how do you cater that message to those students, figure out what they need, when they need it, and sending it to them. And I think, that, yeah, to your point, that's, that's the exact kind of thing that students want. They want to they feel like they're really a part of, that their journey is important to the institution. Uh, and they are a unique flower here. Everybody uh, doesn't want to be just an average person coming through the door. So uh, the more I think we can inform that for students, I think the better. So Mitchell, I don't know if you wanted to have some parting thoughts for the folks who are here. Well, I just uh, really am, am thankful that you guys um, took the time to come today, and uh, especially during spring break, it's, it's really great. Um, I, I really appreciate Eric's time in this. And um, the thing about professional development is, is that it never works when it's one-off. It's nice to come and feel inspired and to have these patterns exposed to us, but I really encourage you to look around who's in the room today and to find people that you can have continued conversations with about these topics. Because the thing is about any university is, is that a large system of, of people is going to go back to the status quo every single time. And that's we're constantly working to shift things in the right direction. And we're working together to do that. And so I really encourage you to, to look around the room and to, to, to have kind of some nodes where you can turn to people and say, hey, how are you doing on, on that? We had that thriving thing. How are you doing on that um, pushing in the right direction? And have a continued conversation about this. Um, for those of you who are interested, we'll, we may even have follow-ups on this. It's, it's um, not unlikely that Eric would, would be um, through town again. And if he is, we could set up a follow-up visit and, and, um, and come back and say, hey, how is this going? How are we applying this? As a, as a word of kind of interest, we, we are going to use the Thriving Quotient here on campus this coming fall for all of our incoming students. Um, we, we have for the last three years done surveying of the incoming students through the orientation um, sign up process. And so we feel like this fall is another opportunity to do that with the incoming students. And so we're actually going to administer this um, to our students. And those results will be made available somehow. We don't know if it will be tied to individuals or if it will be made like kind of some group summary data that will be made available. But it's certainly something that um, is going to be a continued kind of push, at, at least in that, in that arena of actually administering this survey on this campus to the, the class um, that's coming in this, this coming fall. So, um, so, so that's kind of where things are at. Let's um, give Eric a round of applause. Thank you for having me. Um, our website's up on the screen. It's been up there for a little bit. So I've got my, my personal research email is on our website. Uh, it's a pretty simple website. I'm the admin, so if you find a bug, let me know. Um, otherwise, you can reach out to Mitchell or John, and they can connect you with me as well through to my Civitas contacts. If you want some easy read information, or if you've got some colleagues who weren't here today, and if you say, hey, there's this video available, you can watch that. But there's also these primer things you can read. We have, uh, so. Lori did, Lori Schreiner did a three-part series in About Campus. They're linked on the website under our Lit Stuff 
and about campus, if you don't know that journal, that's an ACPA a journal put out by Josie Bass, uh, and it's written by researchers for practitioners and leaders in higher education. So it's research-based, but it reads like the Atlantic Monthly, like it reads more magazine-like, but it's all research-backed. So Lori has a three-part piece on thriving from, uh, I believe, 2010, and then Lori and I had some follow-up stuff in 2015, 20, late 2014, early 2015, mine on meaning making and hers on sort of this follow-up of thriving. So a couple of really great primers, they're gonna be available through uh, your library resources if you're logged in there through you know, JSTOR or one of those other uh, database resources. And the links on uh, our website will take you uh, to those citations so you can be able to find that stuff there. But otherwise, thanks so much for your time, especially during spring break. We'll give you back an hour of, of your afternoon and uh, have a great rest of your week.